Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Marianne Wolf. Today's show comes to us from the Dudley Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity Student Voices Series, Implications of Desegregation on the North Carolina Teacher Pipeline. This event explored the difficult experiences of students and educators of color during the years following the landmark decision of Brown versus the Board of Education. We'll also discuss how the experiences of desegregation of schools can shed light on the root causes, current barriers, and possible solutions to recruiting and retaining a diverse teaching workforce. You will hear directly from teachers and students at that time. Hosting this event is the Dudley Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity, and we're joined by community activist, Danita Mason Hogans. I just want you to know that I'm so excited to speak with these wonderful pioneers who have really paved the path for those of us educators who are committed to providing a floor and a solid foundation for all of our children. It could be argued that desegregation has had a lasting impression on today's education system. In your opinion, what are three major impacts of desegregation on the teaching profession and education in general that we see today. To see the numbers of black and brown teachers that uh, were not only exited the field, but also were displaced from the field of education. Um, and so what does that mean? What does that mean for our children today? It means that our children don't see people in the classroom that look like them. So that's, that's one of the things. The other is to, also desegregation, also the impact that it had on our teachers in the field as we, we talked about the fact of them being educated and highly educated where some of their white counterparts were not. But at the same time, when we look at positions that are available for them now in the field, they don't have the same opportunity to be able to exceed in the profession in the field. The resources that were available to our black and brown children, uh, to me, it reminds me so much of the way it was when I attempted to integrate schools in 1957. And um, so how can that be access to a high quality education for our children? Uh, there was an element of uh, continuity between school and the rest of society uh, prior to desegregation. Uh, so much so that <clears throat> Uh, in the school in which I began teaching. Uh, I knew every child's parent, I knew every child's background, and I knew, I knew uh, where the uh, needs were firsthand. And, and I had the notion that they had enough confidence in my expertise that when I said something to them, they took it quite seriously. So I knew that the provocation to move from where they were to where they could, uh, could possibly go was as important as the math that I was teaching or the science or whatever else it was. And so there was that inculcation factor that I felt very free to do. I'm not certain that teachers felt, as a matter of fact, I'm certain they didn't feel free to do that as we moved into a, a, a different environment. Uh, first of all, there wasn't enough trust among uh, the parents and parents, um, kids bring to school whatever the parents have inculcated in them. Uh, students don't invent very much in first grade. They, they do what they've been programmed to do. And one of the things they've been programmed to, to do is to have very little faith in the knowledge of people of color. Uh, and then finally, uh, we, we had a support system which we had accumulated from other entities, uh, the faith-based community and, and communities, you know, Boy Scouts were in my school. Uh, uh, programs that would normally not be in school today were in my school, so it didn't differentiate while I was a teacher, I was also a Boy Scout pastor. Uh, I was a 4-H club leader. And, and one hat didn't get in the other way of those because of continuity. We recognize that was more. And that is not at the expense of classroom lesson, by the way. Uh, because back then we used to have something called homeroom. We had 20 minutes at the start of school in which a cadre of kids were assigned to me specifically to every teacher. 
And in that we did what one might have done in, in home. We were aware of, of the law, but we also realized that the law said that we were in loco parentis. That means in the place of parent. <laughs> and I exercised the prerogative that a parent would have been exercising had they had the capacity and capability and all, all that was needed to do so. And so they, that's just a few of the things that we, we might have sacrificed uh, because we didn't. And by the way, they were portable. We simply weren't able to, we were simply able to take them with us. We know that um, school desegregation was a pivotal time for Americans. And it was a, a step towards breaking down systemic barriers and oppression. As we've all reckoned with racist policies, laws, and systems, how can school systems learn from the mistakes during desegregation efforts and use this learning to address issues of educational inequities? And what impact do you think that'll have on the teaching profession and students? I know that being a teacher, starting as a new teacher in 1970, students were angry because they had to leave schools and, and dealing with that, as Dr. Flood said, I did and other teachers did a lot more than teacher content. I taught students and I was trying to help people deal with the anxiousness they were experiencing, the long bus rides, some of them just to get to the school where I was an hour there and an hour back. And, and the anger that they were feeling, I worked with them on that, my students. And teachers who were experiencing that kind of anger in our system, we had three of everything where other systems probably had two. And uh, folks were not happy with the way the desegregation plan for our school system was, was happening. And teachers were highly respected when I started teaching. If you said you were a teacher, it was kind of like you were in the presence of someone really special. And that's what I've seen disappear over time from my own time being in education. There, I was there for 33 years to even today. But getting the respect for the profession back in focus and that, that kind of decision will help young people who want to be teachers, but are afraid, well, I can't live on that salary, or I'm going to deal with a lot of foolishness in a school that I shouldn't have to deal with. But, you know, we're more than teachers when we're there. We are parents. Supporting our teachers, supporting them uh, politically in terms of salaries and restoring the benefits that they used to have in education, all of that needs to happen and put us back, I say, at the top of all the professions because we wouldn't have all the other ones if we didn't have teachers. I uh, bring a little bit different perspective because I was not an educator. I was a student and I had the opportunity to uh, go to both segregated and desegregated schools. But one of the things that these uh, great educators on the line here have not mentioned was how much the encouragement was just for having them there in the classroom. We got started out uh, when schools desegregated. A lot of things, in my uh, opinion, just went crazy. Uh, very first thing they did was they started taking, uh, as, as we know, they started taking Black kids out of their neighborhoods and busting them to other schools. Well, along with the long drives and all the other things that had to go on, um, there was the loss of community. The reason that I think so much was lost in the respect for teachers, respect for the profession and so forth, was because by the time they got to that end of that long bus ride, the people who were meeting them there when they stepped off the bus, whether they looked like them or not, were not necessarily encouraging uh, loving, if I can say that, uh, kind of influences for them. So, so that was one thing. One of the other things that went on was when I began to understand what the civil rights movement was about, it was to make sure that we had equality. Uh, you know, we wanted the same thing to have in the other schools. They weren't going to give them to us, so we were going to have to go to their schools. But we still are wanting those same things, those same equalities. I want my grandkids to be able to have all the same opportunities um, that 
you know, that, that the level field, we, we talk about a lot that the level field, that the, um, pardon me, the playing field be level. Our schools, along with our teachers, used to be integral to the community. They were what bound the community together and the people together. Well, now those schools that were standing in the 50s and 60s and 70s have become um, decrepit, run-down buildings in the middle of a community, as opposed to putting money back in I'm, I'm not necessarily an aggregate, uh, excuse me, uh, an advocate for lead segregating schools, but the school is there in the community. And that's how you get to know the people around you. And that's how you get to see the teachers coming up and say, you know what, I want to be like them. I want to be like, you know, one of them in my community. Prior to desegregation, being an educator was a prominent profession among black and brown communities. However, now the state and nation are experiencing a lack of diversity in the teaching workforce. And I was just wondering, based on your experience, why do you think this is the case? And what do we need to do to recruit and retain black and brown educators? One of the things that I see now is that a lot of our institutions that are uh, that had teaching programs no longer have those. Uh, and as Dr. Lowry talked about the fact of, of encouraging people in the field to be able to go into education, a lot of kids coming in today have chosen not to, to go into, into that field. So we have to continue to do that. Uh, but at the same time, they have, the education field needs to be available for them when they go into that and go into that college. What happens is that a lot of the HBCUs across the country, the same kind of thing has happened. So we're not producing the teachers for our black and brown children. And that's hurting our kids. After the break, we'll have more on implications of desegregation on the teacher pipeline. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Participate Learning, uniting our world through global learning. Welcome back to Education Matters. We are so pleased to be joined by such wonderful guests today. I know that you entered into the school system and um, I wonder what difference do you think it would have made had we not lost approximately 75% of our black educators when you went to the school? What impact and what difference do you think that would have made your transition easier? And why do you think that might be important? In terms of making it uh, easier, it would have because resource wise, the, the only real difference that was, excuse me, I shouldn't say only, the major difference that was missing was the resources. We had, we were out of our communities were coming great black doctors and lawyers and, you know, teachers, of course, and every profession. We were turning out the people. Um, what we didn't have was the resources that when we stepped out, that we could step out onto a level playing field. We had to start out running uphill before we got to the flat part of the field where we could uh, equally compete as it were. And, and, and many, many, many never reached that. As Dr. Scoggins said there, um, it is, um, you know, it, it just, it's terrible that we're losing so many teacher programs and HBCs when we see the disconnect that's going on. So um, it would not have been, I mean, it, it still would have been a bit of a difficult transition just because the um, resources were different because they'd had, in, in my particular case, when I, I went there in the sixth grade, they'd had a, a five-year run and head start on me and learning things that I had to catch up on. Uh, were that not the case? Were we able to have those same resources at, at Lincoln when I was at Lincoln High School there in, in Chapel Hill when I was there? It, I mean, it would have been a walk in the park, okay? Again, because it was nothing uh, educationally, uh, if I can use my air quotes now, that we lacked. We just didn't have the materials to kind of and the resources to catch up with where they were. We know that teachers are the most important school-related factor um, in influencing student outcomes. So I'm interested, Dr. Lauer, Dr. Flood, on your thoughts on um, how we can utilize lessons from desegregation to prepare and support educators to ensure that they are creating inclusive, anti-racist, and just environments for student success. Being that role model all the time, wherever we find ourselves, 
and representing our profession is one of the things that will help us draw students of color back into education, offering them opportunities for uh, resources. I know housing, uh, stipend money, all kinds of things like that's available to students in my community now that was not available to me or to the generation even after me. But that's, that's something that, that has to be highlighted and something that has to be shared and things that have to, students have to know about resources. And uh, I see that as a shortcoming in some areas. I've always believed that, that uh, heroes matter. Uh, and all my heroes were teachers, every single one of them. Uh, there were people about whom I had heard, but they don't, they're not my heroes. I mean, they did spectacular things. I heard about Jackie Robinson. I heard about, yeah, I played a little baseball, but I couldn't be Jackie Robinson. But, but I could be Sherman Jones, <laughs> who, who played in the Dirt League, and, and I could touch him. I could be so then touch him. Now, if you, don't, if you have to look much farther than the end of your dinner table for a hero, you're starting with a problem to start with. And, and uh, 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 Dennis McCaskill, who was the first male teacher, I didn't have a male teacher until I got in the 10th grade. All my teachers were women teachers. And, and so, I, and, and I was looking as I, <laughs> and Stanley reminds me, my father was alumnus in the fifth grade, a fine man, uh, but there were certain things he wasn't able to teach me. Uh, and and there, were, uh, there were instances that had very little to do with the geometry Mr. McCaskill was teaching although I did learn his geometry very, very well. But in addition to that, Mr. McCaskill would come by and say, Dudley, let me see your clean handkerchief. And I said, what's that got to do with geometry? You'll go along better if you always have a, do you know to this minute, I, I don't go anywhere without a clean handkerchief. Um, <laughs> he said, here's some long socks that go over your calf. I, my dad wore gum boots. I, I never seen anybody with long socks that went over. There's more to education than schooling. And I think we've confused the fact that schooling and education are equal. They are they're not the same thing. Education extends schooling, provides you with an opportunity to learn how to get an education. I've been to school some part of every year since I was five years old. But most of what I know I learned somewhere other than school, most of it. Now, that isn't to say that what I learned in school wasn't the driver, because had I not had the schooling, I could have not. I could not have capitalized on the other environment. But I think we have confused something about what teachers ought to be and do. I, I, think, I think we've, we've, we've begun to dictate what you can and cannot do. And so spontaneity has gone out of our profession. Uh, I taught because I always, I always thought that uh, great teachers teach because they can't help it. I still believe that. Great teachers teach because they can't help it. We don't talk about the right things, folks. If we want to make this a, a glowing profession, we have to talk about those things that we know for a fact are critical to people. Not what they like, what is critical to them. Critical to, critical to people is first of all, they want to be able to think. I never met anybody who didn't want to be able to think. So I want my students to know if you come in here, you're going to learn to think. And if you learn to think you're needing less of me, you'll need less of anybody because you will make decisions and you'll be able to. Uh, secondly, you need to know the fundamentals of, of how the political system works. You need to know the fundamentals of that because you live in a political system. You live and die in it. Your birth certificate was a political document, your death certificate. So from the womb to the tomb, you will be in a political system. So whether anybody tells me I can teach politics or not, they, they gotta be kidding me. I'm going to teach politics. My subject matter was mathematics. At one point, one point it was English, but I taught the political system. You gotta know that. And then I taught the economic system. These are things that I don't know that are being taught. As a matter of fact, fairly certain they aren't. And I'm reason, the reason is because you've been dictated to what you can teach, how much of it, what you may not teach, and, and they would fire me if I were teaching that. Be, <laughs> because because I, I, I'm going to, kid ask me a question, if I know the answer, I'm going to give it to him or her. Or whatever the penalty is, I'd rather get forgiven than, uh, 
later on. But uh, and so we've moved away from having the dignity that a teacher has to have to be effective. He or she has to have the latitude to do what he or she knows works with this particular cadre of youth. In the, in the 12 years, I thought I never had two classes of life. In particular, I don't know that we have enough information about Native folks and the integration or desegregation um, of Native children in the school systems. What are your thoughts on that and how important do you think it is that we document some of these stories in history so that we can learn from them? All that needs to be, I say, written down because I, I've seen people talk about it without information, without knowing. And I saw schools, people march at schools that were predominantly Indian schools because their children had to leave that school and go to another community. And, and I shared about the young men from a school system that was within a city limits that came to the high school where I taught because they weren't allowed to go to the school there. And we, we have to write that. Someone has to tell our story. Someone has to, to be part of that. One young lady that I taught in high school wanted to tell her story about being in school during desegregation and the impact it had on her life. So she asked a group of women, you know, can we tell our stories? So we wrote our stories, someone scripted our stories and we did a production at a regional theater. And we told our stories about our teachers and about the schools and about one young lady who, who was there during desegregation and the friends that she developed. And she said that that come from the support that came from the teachers who were in that school. I was, um, I, I can remember opening the fall of 1970 and there were teachers there who had been reassigned. They still came to that school every day in defiance of being reassigned to other schools. And we have to tell our stories because it's not in the books. No one's going to write about it. And I'm still amazed at my own learning process about all the things that have been um, created, invented, developed by people of color in this country that uh, it's not in the books. I, I checked the books, my grandchildren, uh, two in high school and one in elementary. Some of those things aren't in the books and they surely aren't in the books about our folks at any level. So we have to tell our own stories and, and that I'm so proud of that production that, uh, that we were able to tell our stories. And you know, everybody has a story. And if it's not shared, if it's not written down, if there isn't some history that's documented, decolonizing our thinking, our way of uh, living, deciding that a certain standard is the way we have to talk or the way we write or the way we do things. I said, that's because the people controlling that were the people writing the books, creating the education system. And I, I've been sharing since we talked earlier in the week, Dr. Flood said about uh, education was never supposed to be for people of color. It was not, it was never supposed to be for people of color. And, and again, I still encounter in my life, and this is 2022, folks who still think that way. Thank you for taking time with us to learn and think about education. That's all for today, and we'll see you next week.